The Reef Therapy Podcast is powered by ICP Analysis. If you'd like to win a free saltwater ICP analysis kit and a freshwater analysis kit, all you have to do is leave a comment down below using the hashtag what's in your water. If you're listening to the audio only version, head on over to YouTube and you can enter in the comment section there. ICP Analysis will test over 50 elements down to parts per trillion. These tests can also be used to see if there's any undesirable elements in your aquarium as well. Register your aquarium on the ICP Analysis app, fill your sample, place it back into the bag, slap on that included postage, and have your results one to three days after it's received. More at icpanalysis.com. Hey, Reef Builders, and welcome to the Reef Therapy Podcast, powered by ICP Analysis. Today, we're going to get an update on everything. Also, chat with a guest who many suggested that we have back on the show, Mr. Salem Clemens. How's everybody doing tonight? What's up, Pretty guys? Good. It's the first day of vacation for me, so I have a I have the next 10 days, 10 days without wow. the full-time radio job. Yeah. And... So that's, that means not having to wake up at 3.30 in the morning, which is fantastic. <laughs> what are you going to do early. with all that lost time? Uh, I'm going to work on Reef Builder stuff. So Yes. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> it never ends. The work never ends. Uh, let's go around and let's see how everybody's doing. Uh, Raj, we'll start with you. What's up? How you doing? How's things um, reefing related or not? It's good. It's good. Um was working on my sump and it should, I guess after the break now, it'll be ready for the grand reveal. And that actually makes me more stressed out than anything else because it's taken so damn long. It's been built up now and it's, I'm just waiting for the responses. Like that's it. You know, the, the whole <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> he, went, he went to Petco and got a 60 gallon Equion. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just some Tupperware I found. <laughs> Yeah. Put a bowl can in it. That's yeah. right. That's all you need, right? Anything yeah, else so going tank-wise, on? Tank wise, that's about it. You know, uh, not not much in that regard. Just I mean, work was busy. All the last minute stuff, just trying to get everything out the door before the end of the year, all the last minute orders, the uh, aquariums realizing that they need stuff and they've got to have it in, you know, whatever, five days, seven days, whatever it is. And so a lot of chaos this time of year, but other than yeah. that, yeah, all good. It's, it's, it's oddly enough, um, after we talked to Rich, like a few days later, my kids went uh, to do glass blowing locally. And uh, they obviously, they did not make anything for me. So totally disappointed <laughs> in them. <sighs> yep. Big thumbs down. So still no pieces for my light yet. I looked up uh, the Chihuly stuff on Wayfair and yeah. because it's just at this point, it's it's almost like Kleenex, you know, it's like you can get this style of light in many different uh, price ranges. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm getting targeted ads on my Facebook whenever I open it. So I'm getting like these crazy chandeliers and light fixtures. So I appreciate that. Thank you so no much problem. Uh, for that, Raj. Uh, I don't think we talked about this last time you were on Salem, but I've noticed, you know, after following you for the last couple months now, uh, not awkwardly, uh, <laughs> you're, you're kind of selling frags on the side. So do you have a tank there in your apartment at, at school? I've got way too many tanks, actually. I've got, so this is like my quarantine tank. It's just like a Nouveau 40. I need to like, I got lazy and had to take the reef brights off. I need to put the other side. There. That's my quarantine tank. I've got like a little 10 gallon nano right here. And then in my living room, so like you walk in, like the maintenance people come in and they're like, what the fuck? Like it's a six <laughs> foot and then a four foot and then like a two by two all plumbed together. And then it goes down in the cryptic sump and the 75 gallons. That's like my farm system. And then each has like a different lighting. So Halide T5 reef brights, then eight bulb ATI dimble, like T5 with reef brights and then Radeon T5 reef brights. So, I've just been taking stuff under the different spectrums, identical par, and seeing what happens. Just see what I would like for like a when I get out of the apartment and put some money into some more tanks. What I want to do lighting wise, and then this is like a, I got a two bedroom because I have too much shit, pardon my language, and um, <laughs> so I've got a whole rack in front of me that you can't see, which is where I grew a bunch of phytoplankton, and then I've got buckets on the ground, 
where I do pods. So it's uh, the whole, and then the bathroom in here is the RODI room. So the whole apartment is just like a fish store, basically. Do you yeah. do you have roommates at all, or is it just you? It's just me, and then you know, my girlfriend's over here a lot, but we'll spend most of the time at her house. So that's <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> I feel like this is very similar to how Raj, you kind of started. Didn't you have a whole bunch of stuff in your apartment in college as well? Oh, I totally had a whole bunch of stuff in my apartment, but I had roommates. So I, oh. I couldn't leave things all over the place out in the main area, but uh, stuff trickled out there for sure. So are your friends impressed with this Salem or do they care? Yeah, they just like, they know it's a rabbit hole. They've known me for long enough, like my high school friends and stuff. They're like, don't oh. ask him questions. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, yo, you got another one, huh? I'm like, yep. Yep, I did. But some of them have kind of like, uh, through osmosis, picked up on the language. Like, I took them to some of the shops with me, or like, we'd go around and sell coral. And they're like, this is like a drug deal, dude. You're meeting them in a parking lot. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That's pretty much how it is. But yeah, I think so, one of my buddies might come with me on a couple of the. I'm planning on doing a couple of the shows in the spring. He'll probably come with me and help out because he likes it enough. So I think I'll be able to get him to get a tank. Which tank is doing the best? And then which, which tank are you kind of struggling with? So, yeah, my grow out system, it's it's pretty, pretty on point right now. Stuff's really ripping. Uh, my little 10 gallon display tank is, uh, <laughs> well, I did some different things to it. And right now it's an algae ridden nightmare and I have the lights off and I'm just going to reset it. So. I'll probably just drain it and do something new with it. It's uh, I gave up on it and then just transfer everything out to the main grow out. So that's not really even a tank right now. I look gotcha. at it and I just cry. So <laughs> I think we all have those tanks in our house, right? Yeah, we've I all been a there. Couple right now. I finally I get a chance to like clean some of the stuff. Uh, the Red Sea has been the most consistent, and I've been cleaning that because of, I don't know. I think um, Jim had mentioned it. Telegram had mentioned it. It's like once you get a bigger tank, and it's nice. And you have like cabinetry and stuff you want to keep it clean so uh but the lagoon sitting on a two by four stand and the um, <laughs> anemone tank is like just over here on the desk and the clownfish like peek through the algae on the on the glass and like, hey <laughs> love to see you again bro <laughs> remember when you is used to you? love us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, um, talk visit, about it's us. been so long. <laughs> uh yeah so the uh, red sea is doing doing pretty well um I don't know. I, I'm having some, I, I think I'm just having that early pale kind of SP. I, I'm starting with a lot of SPS, which, you know, I, I've never actually done before, but it's, I'm, I'm going through a pale stage right now where I'm trying to keep nitrates up, um, phosphates around like 0.08. So I don't, I don't see that being a problem. I just don't know. I, I always go back to our conversation that we had last time and wondering if this is more of a bacterial thing than anything, just like there's a lack of, um, lack of that microbiome in there right now. I actually have results from my aquabiomics test that just came in last week so Ooh. be interesting to to have you take a look at that salem and, and give me your opinion for sure yeah so i don't know it was i i kind of you know it, it's like looking at your first icp test and you're like well i see some things that are out of whack here i don't really know how to handle those but everything is just a learning experience all the time and you're always learning new stuff and a lot of this stuff is like you know scientist level uh, you know, grade kind of stuff. And you're looking at all these bacteria strains and you're like, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. But uh, there's bacteria in it. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that worked, but the sand did something. There you go. Yeah. I just don't know if it's the right stuff, you know, so, or, or enough of the right stuff to, you know, kind of promote growth and all of that. I still have not started um, dosing anything. I haven't dosed calc or anything yet. Um, thinking that maybe pH is a little bit low. I was going to get the, uh, the apex on it just so I could see what the pH was. Cause that's the only pH tester I have right now, uh, to monitor. I don't have like a probe, like a handheld probe or anything. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of going through that, that initial, I don't know what's going on kind of phase that you go through with a new tank. But, uh, I have a confession to make. Um, oh, and, uh, so um in the episode with jason brown on orthodox reef we had talked about uh easy simple qt setup and i did not do that 
and I got a purple tang, and the purple tang <laughs> has ick. <laughs> oh no! You don't say. Uh, and I wonder the, why that would be. Uh, yeah, right. I'm shocked. Many things here. I have many questions. Um, I have consulted with Raj a little bit. I've consulted with several different people on how to combat this in the display tank, because you know, as we've kind of as I've talked about with numerous people, catching them is stressful. Dripping copper is stressful. It's all very stressful. And this is like it like it's a healthy, fat little fish. You know, it's he's eating still and he's doing all the things. So before I go through the remedy that I am kind of I've chosen to go with, my biggest question for you, Salem, is my local fish store owner was like, are you running UV? And I said, not yet and he said well if i had known that i wouldn't have sent you home with this purple tang <laughs> and i go wait a second now like okay so can we have good bacteria in the tank and still be running uv because i know last time we talked it was very like you know anti-uv anti kind of uh antibiotics those kinds of things so i would love to hear your take on like your style of reefing and utilizing uv at the same time yeah, so this is the, you know, this is the cost benefit analysis part of it. So UV is awesome for fish. Like absolutely, you can't deny it takes out like everything, right? If you if you get the right, right flow rate enough time, it certainly can help. So, in this instance, you've got a new tank, you've got, you know, the sand in there. It's it's pretty much still kind of getting started. SPS are already kind of pale and stuff. It's like, okay, you don't have like a trillion dollars of like a PC rainbow and like a like, you know, a home wrecker that's, like, supremely colored up you might mess with. But you do have a pretty expensive fish that has ick, so, like, I'd throw UV on it. You can always add stuff later on, add some more rock, add some more sand. Um, and this is actually, uh, you can be a test subject. So you've got your aquabiomics before UV. Do it with the UV, see what changes, and then maybe add some more live sand down the road and see what happens. But I'd say uh, worry about saving the fish and, you know cross the other bridge when it comes to it. I think it makes sense to use UV in some instances. And I think this is one of them. Okay. Well, I went and I, <clears throat> in a panic, because it was kind of the way, the when I started seeing the spots, I was like, is it velvet? Is it ick? Sent some pictures to some people. They're like, that's definitely ick. And in, I think it was after hours or something, I contacted my LFS. I was like, do you guys have any UV in stock? And he was like, we do have one, it's like $8 million. And I was like, okay, what's another option that we can go with here? <laughs> and so Petco has this green killing machine. Oh uh, yeah. UV and it's 24 Watts and it was like a hundred bucks. And I thought, you know, on a pinch, at least I'm running something through UV. I don't know how effective it is, but I will say that the combination of what I'm doing has helped. It's not progressed. It's actually decreasing, which is fantastic, at least from my observation. And the other tactic that I'm using is uh, one from Raj, where you just soak the food in as much stuff as you can. Celcon <laughs> and yep. uh, what's the other one I'm using? Yep. Uh, it's from Boyd. Vita I used to Vita use Chem. Chem's Vitality. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I like, I, I like yeah. Celcon a lot. You're already doing that. That's Celcon's yeah. awesome. Celcon's hmm. something special about that. Yeah, yep. it really is. So it's great. So I've I've noticed change, and it, I've been doing this for well, only 36 hours at this point, and I've doubled my feeding. So I feed a little bit in the morning, feed a little bit at night, and then I've got the uh, the auto feeder that feeds in the middle of the day. So there's just some food in there at all times. I know that I'm going to have to pay for at some point via extra nutrients, but I'm totally cool with doing some extra water changes just to save this, you know, almost $250, $300 fish. <laughs> I mean, you were low on nitrates. So you how are anyways, you? So that's, you know, there you yeah. Go. Yeah. So how are you gauging that it's having an effect or the fish is getting better? Just from an observational standpoint, I've, I, I like seeing this at its height. It was, it was a little scary. Um, it wasn't the worst ever. Like I said, you've, you've seen ick bad on fish at your local fish store at times, right? And they're just like swimming funny and just kind of they look like they're wasted. And 
I've never seen a energy change in this fish. It's just always, you know, been eating. It's been doing its thing. Um, and the change that I've noticed is that it hasn't it hasn't gotten worse. It's gotten a little bit better. So I just looked tonight before the podcast and I think the spots have gone down now. So hoping that it's shedding those, hoping that they're going into the UV, hoping that that whole cycle is at least being mitigated at the at the moment i realize that once it's in your tank it's kind of in your tank unless you go fallow for a little bit or i think what is it ick is 11 weeks or something like that yeah 72 days yeah yeah even even with that i mean you've got multiple strains of crypto right and, they, and i know they were studying it at one point to see if they were actually different species because they were so different in their incubation period and the size um, but as of right now, this, there's different strains and they found that some of them can just be, they can go dormant for a year. So even if you let your tank go fallow for a year and put your fish back in, they can get reinfected with uh, crypto again. So, you know, none of those techniques are really going to eliminate it. There's a lot you can do. I mean, as they go through that life cycle, the fish is going to look like it got better because it doesn't have the white spots anymore. But, you know, that's just part of the life cycle that they're going to hit the sand bed and reproduce. And then that's where UV comes into play is when they hit that Theron stage and they're free floating or free swimming. And that's when they're actually going to infect a fish. And they're only really viable for, what, 36 hours, something yeah, like that Theron's in that like stage. Yeah, Theron's like 48 max. And that depends on the subspecies. So, yeah. well, subspecies, you know. Right, right, right. So that's where UV comes into play, because as that water passes through the UV, DNA gets altered and they're done. Depending on the UV, obviously, if the fluence rate isn't right, if the UV is just not strong enough or your flow rate is wrong, it doesn't do much of anything except heat your water up. But as they hit the sand, and you're not really going to know it, so as you're experiencing ick, you just have to, for me, I always siphon the hell out of the sand because you've got to get those cysts out of that sand bed as much as you can uh, kick it up into the water column because i'm a big uv guy so i want to nuke everything that that's in that water column um, and, and you know like i told you feed the hell out of that fish uh, the healthier the fish is the stronger the immune re response and they're able to just kind of recover from it i've always looked at it like like herpes they're going to carry it around forever and if they're pretty healthy, you know, that they, they do yeah. OK. I've been watching the other fish, too, and I haven't seen anything. I know that it can kind of once it starts on one fish, you can kind of see it on the other ones. And I thought maybe f for sure the sailfin um, would look to, like he had some spots, but I don't see any. And the other weak fish and there's the chromis, but I still don't mm. see my Achilles tank. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Used Magnet. to get ick like. Oh my God. And it, it would look painful because you would see the crypto on its eyeball, like <laughs> just on the eyeball. And it, uh, that part always tripped me out. Like, God, that's got to hurt. Uh, but he didn't really flinch. I mean, he would, just, he would be covered in it. And then he just, he'd keep going. Yeah. So here's another question for, okay. So say I become a, an experienced reefer for once and actually set up a QT tank. So you're setting up a QT tank, maybe you're running, you know, some sort of medication or copper or something. Maybe you're just observing for however long. Once you drop it into the new tank, doesn't it or into the like into the Red Sea here? I mean, it's that's a free for all at that point, right? Even even if you did QT it for a little bit, are we or are we looking for other things like marine velvet and things like that before we introduce? Like I said, there's there's bigger fish to fry with QT. And I mean, ick is it sucks, but it's, you know, unless you've got like a really, really sick fish, it's not going to ever really kill it. It's more so just a pain in the ass and it can lead to secondary infections by lowering its initial immune response. But I mean, QT is like, you know, internal parasites, you got flukes, and then there's like the crazy stuff. You got like brook, then like, you know, velvet, like that's the that's the really bad stuff that you don't want anywhere near your display. Sure. So, I mean, it's, it's good. You only got ick, you know, that's something you can work with and, you know, invest in a really good UV and it can least, you know, management over a period of time. But 
you know, because it's an actual display, there's not really, yeah. Got to boost the immune response of the fish and hopefully nuke them when they go mm -hmm. back up to infect when they're free swimming. But, I mean, yeah, QT, it depends on how you want to cut it. I mean, there's a thousand ways to skin that cat. Copper's great. Copper does about everything. I mean, there, then there's, you know, you always got to have, like, you know, metronidazole or prosy on deck for parasites. But then you got stuff that's sensitive, like rasses. Yep. So then it's a whole other balancing act. Formalin's good to have on hand. Um, when I've QT'd stuff before, just because I was too busy to, like, have to test copper a lot, I would just, like, kind of just prophylactically feed Canaplex and Metroplex with Focus. But obviously that's, like, not really with... So you got a broad-spectrum antibiotic and then an anti-protozoan uh, agent. Fungal stuff is kind of obvious if you see it. It's usually external, so you can treat for that if you got to deal with it. But... I mean, like I said, there's a thousand ways to do it. I mean, like, humble fish, you know? Oh, something something I just thought of that you might do in your display, you could dose peroxide. That's something you can get away with. Uh, then it can actually, it can drop your nutrients. So I used to work at a pet co, and we were not allowed to use copper or any chemicals. So I was like, how do I deal with, like, like, I mean, I saw it all, like, brook and everything. But we had UV sterilizers, so I could adjust the flow rate, and then I could dose peroxide, and the free radicals from peroxide at least sometimes, you know, can kill some of those free swimming forms. So in combination over a period of time, you can eliminate it. I think it was, I think it was on the Humble Fish forum or like on a Facebook group, but someone did peroxide for an extended period of time. And they sent in the aquabiomics like fish parasite test before and after, and they were able to 100% eliminate it, whatever strain they had. Yeah. So that might be something hmm. to think about if you're really wanting to get rid of the ick, but it'll nuke the microbiome for sure. But I mean, you got... It's a bigger fish to fry. Just don't invest in like a lot of really nice coral or something, maybe. <laughs> I, I never liked medicating the the the, the, blah, the yeah, display tank, right? I mean, it, I I don't want to dump that in there, especially for ick. Yeah, that just seems like nonsense. It, you know, for in quarantine, chloroquine was always a good uh, option for me. That worked really well. Works on ick. You know, it's it's. It's Does kinda, it work for COVID though? You can always try it. Okay. Okay. I just want to check. Always try it. That was but um, option. has to be taken rectally. So you know, <laughs> just be aware of that. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yes. I was never really worried about ick when it came to QT though. It was everything else. You know, I mean, you're, you're looking for other internal parasites, your worms and flukes are your easy ones to spot, yeah. but it's all the unknowns, you know, make sure that they're, they're isolated so you can at least do some prophylactic and just observation see how the fish is acting um does it does it eat does it know what we're feeding it is food that's really the big thing there is it's quarantine it's not a hospital right so yeah you're it's just isolated that way you can control what you're doing to it and i would feed when i got a new fish probably 12 to 15 times a day just all these different combinations and i had some tricks that i would do to get them to recognize that the stuff that we're giving them is food because a lot of them just don't know they haven't been fed in a long time um, if you picked it up from the store they're they're picking you know they're they've been fed whatever the store is feeding them so yeah they, they have to be trained really yeah that's the big thing i've i've, I've stuck a couple of sheets of nori in there on a clip and they're like mm, what the hell is this <laughs> the sailfin came up a couple of times and just kind of took a little nibble at it but and then i left it in there for a couple hours just to see if they would pick at it and it was still all there and you know you've yeah. seen the tanks where you stick a sheet of nori in there and like the entire population of fish is on it the second it goes in so i guess just keep kind of kind of garlic soap or, or introducing it Garlic soak. I still, yeah. you know, I know it doesn't do anything, but garlic is delicious. And so I figured <laughs> when, in my, when I would make my paste, it would have garlic. It, it would have Celcon. I would use that Seachem Vitality. Um, then I was Metro with Focus. Um, Focus binds it, makes it taste a little bit better. That's where the garlic also comes in. Because I don't know if you've tasted Metro, but it's disgusting. It's really, really foul. <laughs> So if the fish can taste, they're not going to want it. They can't taste. <laughs> uh, just I am looking at my, <laughs> I'm looking at my DNA results right now, and I am 
let's see i'm 100 percent that bitch so <laughs> uh <laughs> no i'm looking at it it came up as uh uranema uh marinum is no, in the not, tank and that was pre no. was pre-fish it's pre-fish so this is the, oh, the, the sand. Oh. It's the reef scabies. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> we made the joke. You vindicated. So, oh Jesus! Says that my my level is 0.59 percent with a prevalence of 9.4. Um, I think that's another bet level. you've oh lost. Oh my god! Don't get any chromas. <laughs> But if there was any fish that was gonna get it, wouldn't it be the chromus? Wouldn't it like wouldn't the chromus? For yeah. whatever reason, they're like they're really more susceptible to it. I mean, other stuff can get uranema though. Uranema is like top three on the shit list. You know, that's that's some bad stuff yep. to deal with. That's like, oh my god, nothing kills it. UV like hardly works like that because they can live off of other yeah. stuff besides fish. They'll just eat detritus. So like once you have that, like you got to drain the tank, man. I don't know any other way. Yeah, if if, if you can survive <laughs> by eating shit. You, you, yeah, <laughs> no. You were so, not defeating so, that. I mean, is this something I need to actually be worried about? Your anima sucks, man. It, it, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. But, I just, uh, I, but what, again, what could he possibly do about it at this point? Drink, yeah, nothing, man. Like, right? Yeah, nothing. The peroxide stuff, so maybe. I'm, but even then, like, I doubt it. Your anima's bulletproof. It's so hardcore. Mm. I think uh, so. I would love to see one of these DNA tests on an older tank, like a three or four year old tank. Would more parasites be present in an older tank like that, um, or would it be flawless? You know, how much of like like an ICP test? You know, how much of this stuff is just kind of in the water, and we don't need to be freaked out about it? Versus like. I'd say this, fish parasites you know. are a lot easier to deal with than any coral parasites. So, I mean, that's going to depend on the, the quarantine practices of the owner at that point. I mean, you could have a thriving tank that has uranema and ick, you know, that's detectable in it. And they've just got their fish healthy enough or they don't, for whatever reason, they haven't gotten infected. And they could have awesome coral at that point. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's a lot easier to eliminate as a hobbyist. So, I, I mean, like, like, you know, no matter how much balancing you have, if they're in the system... And these are parasitic types of organisms. At least they can be. So if they've got a food source, they're going to be there. So even if you've got like this amazing microbiome, you had live rock from like every continent or something, it's not going to get rid of the problem. You know, once you got it, you got it. Gotcha. Awesome. <laughs> All right. We're done with Salem. Um... <laughs> Didn't mean to be the, the Grim Reaper there, but yeah. <laughs> No, that's fine. I need to send Not you even these. Salem these, uh, can save you from the reef. <laughs> no, those, <laughs> the dude, reef those things need to be eradicated. I'm all for nuking uranema. That stuff is so bad. Formalin's like about all you got. That's, yeah. But you can't do that in a display. Uh, so. But formalin, no. And it's super harsh, yeah. too. And it's a carcinogen. There's that, too. So, you know, don't like. Yeah, that's. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, now, yeah. Right? Don't lick it. Don't lick anything, though. <laughs> yeah. Don't Do frag those. Like. All right. Everything's well, I'm gonna, a carcinogen. I'm going to send you these results and uh, see what you think about it. You don't it, see Salem did a video for me about the ICP results that I initially got. So I'm going to include that in a Red Sea update that at this point should be out. So uh, definitely check that out. But uh, I'll send you these. You don't have to like go in depth on it, but just I would love your take on on what that is what do you normally charge people for that usually like 20 bucks like i'm not you know like i don't i feel like i shouldn't charge 10 right, right? but like i'm not trying to okay if someone messages me like i feel like you should charge 100 I'm probably <laughs> 20 bucks is pretty <laughs> yeah. cheap I'm, I'm working like the corner here for this stuff you know i'm a college student i probably should charge more but um you know, if you charge just 25 bucks, you could probably get new blinds for that one. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> the extra five will do me really well. Oh, my God. You don't know if we're going to look back on Click this video below someday and <laughs> for the GoFundMe. Go <laughs> I've got a Patreon. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, like if someone sends me, like there's some people it's like, you know, they're just sending me walls and walls of text like, oh, I've also got this problem. And I'm just like. All right, that's going to be 120, like easy right there. This is going to take me like 20 minutes to even think about. Like, I don't even want to even touch that, you know. But usually, if it's someone yeah. just like, it, what, 
when my barium is high, what do I do? I'm like, just send me like 20 bucks. I'll just tell you, man, I don't care. <laughs> like it takes me like five yeah. minutes. Like I just, I just, I get so many messages. It's like, just make it like at least worth my time a little bit here. Instead of out of the kindness of my heart and there's 75 messages and it's all day. Oh, but that's good though. I mean, you're, you're, you have knowledge and that is, it's a product, yeah. right? And that's, that's a work product. So you should get compensated for that. I think that's fair. More than fair. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. I've tried not to gouge um, and be like, uh, like $670 per minute. Sure. But you can do that in five years. Once you've graduated. Yeah, I'll have a degree all, behind my you know, name be like, oh, actually, I'm going to have to, <laughs> there's going to have to in charge interest on this too. I've got a couple of those and they're not worth very much. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I'm starting to realize that, you know, I'm starting to think this whole thing might've been a little bit of a scam, but I'm, you know, semester left, can't <laughs> oh. quit now. If it uh, if it wasn't for scholarships, uh, I would be in so much debt. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's totally. This is going off on a complete tangent now, so we're gonna get yelled at in the comments that we diverted from. We gotta talk about finances how at least we, once. How do we relate it to Rogers the fish? Let's think. <laughs> <laughs> the price is just absurd for education. It's just Silly. way too high. I, I, I thought about going back for my MBA and doing an executive program, right? Because I, I can't enroll in school full time at this point. And I thought it'd be really cool to get my MBA from Yale. So reached out. Uh, They're like, yep, totally qualify. It's going to be one hundred sixty thousand dollars plus plus. Then the plus plus was plus, you know, books and the other plus was the travel back and forth because I have to go to campus for a certain number of times for a weekend uh, to do weekend work. And I'm thinking, holy crap, just one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Right. That's that's a lot of money. And there's no way. I'm not. I mean, I'm self-employed, so it's not like I'm going to go back to my office with my now MBA from Yale and be like, hey, pay yourself more. <laughs> So it's, <laughs> it's on the wall, Rod. It's on the wall, damn it. Gosh. Pay yourself more. <laughs> it's just mind blowing, though. I mean, I knew it'd be more expensive than uh, UGA or some other school, but damn, I was not expecting that number. Yeah, I have some friends that went to Ivy's, and I only reason they're able to is because their parents have very deep pockets. That is only way. Or they had people in their family that went, and they were able to get some, you know, under the table type of money. You know, but yeah. Well, if they're adopting, uh, let me know because <laughs> I'd really like to get that MBA from Yale. <laughs> you just need to know Lori Laughlin. That's it, right? Mm. Oh, you meant like that? You're from Full House? Yeah. Aunt Becky? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's all you got to know. Uh, one more. I have one more question before we move on to the next topic, and that is a Hawaiian yellow tang came in on a breakdown at one of my local fish stores and uh, the owner is offering this fish to me for a decent price. Now it will be bigger than all the other fish in the tank by about an inch and a half to two inches. And I'm a little worried about sticking this big, you know, tang in the, in the tank, but I'm very tempted because it's a Hawaiian yellow tang, which you just don't see anymore. Right? So any advice on what I should do here? I know that I should wait because I have a current issue, but Two actually, beyond that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't we, we're not talking about if I didn't get the DNA test, I wouldn't have known. That's better. You know, I knew I knew <laughs> talk about a skeleton in the closet, fish skeletons in the closet. Damn. Damn. Just talk about the yellow tank. Go. Uh, flip it for a billion dollars on reef to reef. No, okay. no, it, I would totally get yeah, that. Get it, yeah. yeah. If you're worried, use a okay. box. That's a All big, right. yeah. Well, I said, if you're worried, use that? a box, but like, it's going to be the bully. So like, I don't think a box would yeah. maybe if you're really worried, but I don't know if it helped that much. Just feed a lot. They called it, they called it a, um, when the angel video, the French angel video that we did where they stuck the angel through the CT scan, they called their box a howdy box, I think. So the fish can say howdy <laughs> to each other. <laughs> I, I think that's what they called it. That's wacky. <laughs> and it, it tripped up Evie for a second. She was like, I'm sorry, what? 
because we're talking about science and scientific terms the whole time. And then they're like, we have a howdy box over here. <laughs> oh, okay, great. so yeah, get the yellow yeah. tank. I will there's get the no, yellow tank. Definitely get the yellow like, tank. Send the payment now, like in the podcast, go get it. Like there's no excuse not to get it. Yeah, okay. yeah. you can't delay. But put it in a key. Yeah, tank. probably. Well, actually, <laughs> at, at I, this point, put that sucker at this right point, in, yeah, put him in yeah, the display. Yeah. display. If you if Throw you get a third display, problem, it's not it. that big of a deal. I would yeah, do point, I would yeah. do some prophylactic dips yeah. though. Go through that motion and and check the fish. Just take a look at it. Yeah, well, I would imagine if it's been in a hobbyist tank for a couple of years. Yeah, you know, but, but it's obviously acclimated to. Yeah, aquarium it's in the life. store tank yep. now though. Like I said, I'm not trying to talk shit on the store, mm. but like. Stores, you know, it's hard to, if you're not gonna, if you don't have a separate quarantine area, drop of water, all it takes, you know, so, yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate the advice. Now we need to get to another touchy subject, <clears throat> which is the apparent beef between Raj and I've Salem. <laughs> I've seen like 20 comments. They're like, Raj was just really, really going after Salem, but I didn't think it was fair. I was like, what the hell are they talking about? I was... That's what I, I said. Like, what? I thought it was great. He was, I thought it was a great such back a and forth. I, like, I thought it was a great conversation. I, yeah. I did too. I, I thought we had a great conversation. Then getting ripped apart. I was like, like that was a very so respectful and like you know we you know we even came to an agreement at the end. I felt like I don't know. Debate's yeah. bad, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think the is it the YouTube channel. Uh, is it Kalamazoo Reefer or something yes, like yeah. that? Yep. Uh, and I actually, yep. I listened to him the other day and uh, yeah, he, he called, <laughs> I laughed he that. called like, you out. Raj was he did. By, by did. name. I was like, damn. He called me a jerk. <laughs> I was listening to it laughing. He did. He it. totally called me a jerk. Because somebody, somebody sent me that. So I went through the whole video and I'm like, then I had to go back and re-listen to our conversation because I thought, oh man, maybe I'm remembering the conversation differently. Um, yeah. it, there was one part in there where he said that I called your sources. Yeah, liars. I was like, I don't know what he's talking about. Like, wow, I don't know what he's talking about. I was like the only time I said something like that was the claim that if somebody has never had cyano, if they've never had cyano, if that's their claim, they're a liar. So that that's the only time I I said. And I agree that. with that. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So I, <laughs> yeah, right. So <laughs> and I think you were telling a story about some old reefers that were telling you that they didn't have these type of problems. And I'm like, yeah, they're full of shit. They totally probably did. Yeah. Yeah. They, like they I, did. I remember, I remember back to the person they, who they told they me he's it. probably full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> that, uh, but I did talk to him, you know, I went on there. I was like, Hey, you know, great. Cause he, he does go into some other details like about our conversation and kind of, reflects on those and and you know really it he takes it to heart like it there was uh there was some good conversations going on on, on his video and then the conversations in the post below and so I, I i chimed in and let him know that i didn't call your sources liars it was just the cyano deniers <laughs> but uh yeah i could totally kick your ass though oh. you know, if we're gonna beef it out <laughs> we need to have like a like a sanctioned sanction thing in the octagon here or something like i don't know the cage yeah, fight. cage fight oh man official yeah, debate i'll hit you with a chair <laughs> man i would get the elbow I, there's actually there's a few people in this hobby that i would really love to see go at it in the octagon i can know? think of a few <laughs> and we all kind of we all know who those people are but it would just be like an awesome logan paul kind of situation you know we've got a, a boxing ring set we up we need that aqua shell of frag uh, belt as like the winner to get that <laughs> yeah. it sounds like a good charity event hmm. yes the yeah. biggest mouths of reef <laughs> that's right jesus <laughs> uh comment on facebook and youtube but you know can they put their money where their mouth is uh, most awesome. of the time not yeah yeah, yeah, yeah um so there's no beef between you guys so that's good um <laughs> i'm glad we could clear that up i actually like shout out to kalamazoo reaper as well because i, I wasn't like i'm not trying to call him out here because it, i i did go to a couple other the, the videos that he posts and it's a different style for sure he yeah. just like turns on the camera yeah. and talks and just talks and i envy that i wish that uh, that is a style of editing that i could also no, do I like but, uh, he, he does that yeah he, he does that um 
the out loud thinking bit and it's it works it really worked yeah yeah I tried yeah, to comment like on it. like seven of his yeah. things, but I guess I'm shadow banned from YouTube. I tried like four different accounts. I made a new <laughs> email. I'd post the comment. It would delete after 10 seconds. I was like, what the fuck? Wow. So if you're seeing this Kalamazoo Reefer, I like the content. Thanks for the shout out. I don't hate Raj. <laughs> <laughs> I subscribe to you. I liked it. It's cool. That's what I was trying to say for three days, but yeah. <laughs> Um, th there are two other things that I want to hit on in this conversation. And one of them is that you did a live stream for us not too long ago on the Facebook page on the reef builders, Facebook page, kind of discussing your, uh, end of semester kind of results and things like that, that you're working on in school. Can you, can you kind of recap that? Cause I, I, I know that there's not a lot of people that, or, or some people that didn't see it because it's on Facebook. They only listen on YouTube or they only, you know, wherever they get their stuff. But what are your, what are some of your conclusions? at the halfway point of this year found some cool shit in short nice <laughs> um and next topic uh <laughs> that's it um uh, uh, I, I start i like i kind of like went over the history of how i started it. i guess i can talk about that people like that bit so have had, i have a bunch of fish tanks farmed a lot of coral I bought a lot of euphilia, like when it was like expensive, like a thousand dollar a head for a holy grail when Indo was closed stuff. And I'm like, oh, I could just grow this because I can grow coral and flip it. This is awesome. So and I got brown jelly and lost all of it. So I was like, oh, this is not good. Um, nice. And then I had taken microbiology. I was like, huh, no one really seems to know what this is, but maybe I have some of the skills to figure this out. I know how to I know how to culture stuff. I know how to make a Petri dish. This is cool. So then I started looking into it and I was like, whoa. And I went further down the rabbit hole. And after about, you know, two years now, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of like the full, you know, pathogenic pathway of how that stuff works. So like, you know, kind of how we know about ick, you know, like, oh, here's the whole life cycle, same thing. Um, but then from beyond that, I expanded to coral pathogens writ large. And kind of what I'm looking at is the general pathway for how pathogens will infect a coral. So despite the species of coral, there's kind of a conserved genetic pathway for they will get stressed from an abiotic factor. So pH, temperature, salinity swing. That's This is basically how it always happens. After that, they will activate several pathways they use to manage stress. Byproducts of those pathways will be like this chemical that's produced. And it's just a byproduct. You know, there's not really like a lot of use to it. But coral pathogens have evolved to basically smell that. So stuff that's kind of dormant or stuff that's away will then locate to the coral and infect it. So ba basically, uh, stability is really important. You know, like the age old thing of keep your tank stable makes a lot of sense in terms of what I've found because instability is what causes an abundance of these chemical signals and then that will lead to a pathogenic event. So chemistry and biology are very tied together here. Like let's say your aquabiomic results are like as bad as having your anema, right? Like you, let's say you've got like a ton of Vibrio in the tank, something just God awful. Um, you're not going to have like an outright infection unless you have a swing that then essentially weakens the coral's immune system. You know, it's kind of like how we talked about fish. If they're in a weakened uh, immune state, then they're more susceptible to infection. Now, like in the lab, if I take a hundred microliters of a purified pathogen, put it in the coral's mouth, it's going to get infected. But in our tanks, there's a, a lot of space between the corals and these things have to travel high flow is very important oh i have an article wrote probably like by tomorrow um about some things people can do that are just like placing coral in different ways that could actually help uh, prevent infection because they have to most stuff has to go through the mouth or an open wound so fragging is a big time when stuff can get infected too Cherry corals, they have like something on YouTube I watched where they actually, all their fresh frags are in a different tank and they have fresh water. They have like just an ass load of carbon in there and they let it chill for like a week before they put it back to their main uh, grow out systems. And honestly, in terms of what I've determined, that seems like very, very good practice and not a lot of people are doing. Because if these chemical signals are in your main system, that'll cause, you know, a, a domino effect. So basically I am looking at what these signals are, how they're activated, what amount of them is needed to cause a pathogenic event, and which pathogens respond to individual signals. So I'm using a gas chromatography mass spectrometer, or GCMS, which is kind of like ICP, like not, like it isn't, but it is. So like think about how you get your ICP results. 
That's all, you know, like, you know, ionic stuff. It's inorganic compounds. This is organic compounds. So you see like the different amino acids, sugars, or even, you know, more complex organic molecules. So I'm kind of looking at the tank in a much different way that there's not a lot of data about. And I also have a liquid chromatography machine I can use for, you know, longer exposure time to the column and a lot of technical stuff that I'd be happy to talk about in the comments. But that's what I'm looking at is what chemicals happen and what spikes in the coral's mucus during a swing and how pathogens have evolved to detect those. And then hopefully after that, it's Gosh, how do we fix it? It's so interesting. Uh, I feel like as hobbyists, we kind of get hung up on one parameter or another parameter. What's the what's the nitrate number? What's the phosphate number? What do we need to be looking for when really it seems to me like through at least what you're saying is, yes, stability is king, but stability is king so that you're not stressing the coral. So they're, you know, you know throwing up a chemical signal and then the pathogen is just getting right in there. That's that's an interesting take that I've never heard before. So. I mean, you have to, um, you have to think about the awesome. ocean, right? I mean, these animals are very primordial, but they've evolved in a conserved environment for millions of years. And the ocean, I mean, it's changing now, but there's not many changes that they can't anticipate. But in a closed loop, you know, salinity is up. Like, they've they've never experienced a salinity change like that. Or same thing with pH. It's like, well, now pH is going down. But, you know, like 8.4 is, like, that's... In terms of what I know now, which like I say it might change, I'm always learning about this stuff, but pH seems like one of the most important factors for sure. Because I mean, that determines, then that drives a lot of other chemical pathways and, um, you know, exchanges. And also it's one of the things that hobbyists struggle the most with is maintaining a pH of like 8.4. And there really is just so much data behind that number being important. And that's why it's a high pH gang, 8.6, baby. <laughs> gang, gang gang gotta chase it forget out <laughs> chase ph hashtag uh yeah interesting stuff man i i really can't wait to you, i mean you had said stuff you, you you mentioned brown jelly and that you might be onto something there i mean can you talk more about that or are you are you are you withholding yeah i'm withholding for sure um but you know it's the same same basic pathway you know You'll have a stress event and that happens. I mean, typically why aquacultured corals do so much better is there's at least some epigenetic factors, probably. Like this is this is me speculating here, kind of hypothesizing. There's not data behind this, but I assume if you've conditioned these animals to an environment for long enough that is prone to swings, then they're less likely to produce those stress responses because they are used to it. Whereas if you have a fresh import, you know, with like zero membrane, and you throw the torch and a, some revive and then in your tank, which is completely different in the assortment of ways, of course it's going to jelly, you know? Of course you're going to have that pathogenic event that occurs. So, I mean, that's, I, I guess, one, one explanation for why people see these things happen in wild imports and like fresher corals. And also why aquaculture is important, you know, is to get these animals conditioned to our imperfect environments as perfect as we may try to make them. And, um, yeah, that kind of explains like acros are, this is, this is my hypothesis, which I haven't got enough data for yet. And maybe I never will like in my time in college, but my thought is acros and some of these more sensitive species we see die more often are more susceptible to that stress. And with a smaller swing will produce a larger concentration of these metabolites, which cause a pathogenic event. So compared to something like a zoa, which is, you know, hardy it may produce a lower concentration of these signals less often compared to like a speciosa or like one of the really niche like smooth skin acros that just like you see it melt every time. I mean like melting is, I mean it's basically always just a breakdown of those of those core biological functions or a pathogenic event that causes tissue necrosis or both. You're not going to have that unless there's a problem. And there's only going to be a problem if the chemicals basically lead to that answer if that makes sense. So if you catch it in time, I, I think the another hobbyist thing is it'll just chop off the dead part and, you know, rebound. I mean, it. yeah, what fragging are doing stuff, there? just like removing it physically is definitely a good way. You know, if you're having if you have an active lesion where there's an active infection, infection that's moving like you see with STN and RTN. Yeah. Removing that physically, it's kind of like amputation, you know, like if you've got gangrene on your foot before it goes systemic, you want to cut that foot off like Civil War days, you know, or. I guess even now in yep. places without medicine, but 
Um, yep. Yeah, I think that fragging, gluing even, you know, uh, glue is a boundary, like a physical barrier, which is very hard for things to move past. Like, they, you know, it's a very weird substance for things to grow on because it's a polymer. So if you've got glue on an open lesion, there you go. Like a trick that I've used that, you know, this is what I'm happy sharing is uh, mix some glue galls with glue. And then every time you glue up frags, you've got antiseptic in the glue too. So it's localized antiseptic that way, which is, I'd say it's it's probably the same type of stuff as adding iodine to your well and your fragging coral. There's not really any data behind it, but it makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. So yeah. I do it. <laughs> What's your ratio? I don't know. Like, like a glug per drop, you know, like <laughs> the real scientific way. <laughs> the reefer, just yeah, like the reefer grandma. side takes over there. It's like cooking at home. It's like, oh, it looks good. But there's a slight discoloration. It's the best yeah. way to cook. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's so cool. Um, that is yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. I can't wait to hear more about that once you're once you're through. But just I, I love that you're introducing all of these kind of new new ways of thinking, you know, about how, yes, we you know, this is a hobby and these are, you know, these are, you know, creatures from the ocean who live in a totally different environment. And now we've got them in these, you know, these boxes. How do we understand that? And will we ever understand all of it? But it sounds like you're making some decent headway on some, you know, some of the struggles. Like, so I'm face. not going to claim and to have just... all the answers, but I've, I think I've fig- been able to put some, you know, puzzle pieces together to get a better overall look at things for sure. Another interesting thing that we're doing that people don't really think about is we're taking, let's just focus on corals, but we're taking corals from different oceans with different compositions, different temperatures, different pHs, right? All the different things going on and sticking them in a single system that is going to be maybe stable at something else. All the parameters are going to be different. So even in the most perfect conditions, those corals and those fish are all going to be stressed because now their home is different. And we don't know yet what kind of effect that has on the coral, what what um, responses it elicits, and I guess that's what you're what you're looking into, right? and, and that's where these farmed corals come in. Aquaculture really is king there, where these corals are of quote unquote grown up, and that's all they've known is that life. And over certain generations, that that is their home. You know, that is what they prefer. It's it's funny talking like giving these corals things like preferences, and, you know, it's just, <laughs> but you're going to have way more success with the aquaculture stuff than you are wild. Right. I always yeah. did. And now we're lucky that aquaculture has become so big. And so what, so accepted, um, back in the day, it really wasn't really that accepted because you could just get wild colonies for so cheap and, you know, sell the whole colonies. And our colonies back then were huge. Our frags were huge. Um, and, and that's where chop shops came into play. Where, And there's still a lot of chop shops around, like a lot of these basement operations. That That's all they are. They're just chopping up wild colonies and getting them out the door. And you have whatever success or lack thereof with it. But... It'll, it'll be interesting over the next few years to see what happens with that. And as legislation tr- transforms in this country and then the other countries that we'd normally be importing them in from. Yeah. And then see what you come up with. Like, how, how does that bridge the gap? I th- yeah. So are you are you importing anything, Salem, for research or otherwise? No, I've just been growing stuff. I need to get some fresh stuff, though. I do need to get some fresh stuff because I want to look at some different things with wild corals versus aquacultured ones. But I've been using uh, like stuff that's been tanked for like at least a couple months, you know? So yeah, to get some fresh stuff would be, be very beneficial, I would say. So I'll probably get some in like February or something when I get some cash. Probably place a little order and get some stuff in and say, please don't use antibiotics when you bring this in. <laughs> I want to look at things, <laughs> but yeah, that that's should uh, just get in touch with Richard. Yeah. I feel like he's got some good connections of, you know, people that are more science minded. Probably just like transship know. some stuff. I don't think they actually, I don't know. They probably do it over there too. Who knows before they send that off? I don't know, but that's, um, so we were talking about quarantining fish earlier, you know, like hospital tank prophylactic treatment. And this is something I wanted to touch on. This is a very big 
Facebook dog fight I get into quite often. So I wanted to like kind of put the idea out there. So fish and humans and higher organisms are a lot different than coral, right? I mean, we, we've got like our gut microbiota and like there's a lot of data, data that's like if you're like taking amoxicillin every day, you might be more depressed because you don't have as much serotonin and things like that. But if you were to just wipe that stuff out, you would still be able to live. You are an independent and sufficient individual that is evolved enough to be able to rely, you know, live without that mutualistic association. Corals and fish are too, but corals are such primordial creatures that they are wholly dependent on their symbionts. Look at zooxanthellae. What happens if it leaves? They die. Same thing with the bacterial and other like archaea and fungal symbionts as well. Each of them plays a very, very particular role in their metabolism with nutrient cycling or eating these chemical signals that could lead to a pathogenic event or lots of other things. So just saying, all right, got the torches in that have already been aquacultured, put them in the dip. And it's like, you know, I, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> you could be wiping out some of those things that could be key to their long term health. Like, I think there is such a thing as coral quarantine, but prophylactic treatments beyond you know, just some of like, you know, iodine or like the, like, you know, the herbal dips that eliminate like, you know, flatworms and stuff like revive and such we're used to. I think right now at least should have a better magnifying glass to it. And we should think about it more because these animals are not humans. So if that fungus or bacteria that the, co the coral has, that's the one responsible for the brown jelly signal, right? Eliminating that is your key. Or could be your key. So here's the thing that's cool is zooxanthellae produce the signal most of the time. Interesting. So, <laughs> I mean, you can try to eliminate them, I guess. It's a bastard. Yeah. So you can't, that's the thing. Nuking it doesn't solve that problem. That's just a conserved and very innate biological feature. I mean, these things, like, let's say it's a heat shock protein that activates. In order to activate that protein, you got to have a protease cleave some stuff. And then a byproduct of this, you know, protein coming in or enzyme coming in and cutting stuff is this chemical signal. They've evolved to find that. So whenever heat shock protein is activated, this is the residual thing from just the coral trying to save itself from excess heat. Then they're like, bingo, dinner bell, let's go get it. So to, I mean, you got to genetically engineer coral to get rid of that. But at that point, A, it's a shit ton of money. B, it's really tedious because I've, I've used CRISPR in lab, like on yeast and like Literally, like, you know, the best professors in my university, and we still messed it up <laughs> after, like, eight weeks. I mean, it's pretty pretty tedious to do, and there's just not the money behind it, and that's going to take years to get into the hobby yeah. if, it's, if it's even there. So, I mean, yeah, you could fix that with current technology, but as a hobbyist, no. The money has always been an issue for all of things. I mean, look how, how long Cryptocarian has been uh, researched. Yeah. And at, at some point, at one point, they were talking about coming up with a vaccine for it. And I just don't think they got any funding. There was just no money for it because it's not really a big enough problem for, you know, in the global scale, like thinking much bigger outside of the hobby. Yeah, the biggest stuff is stuff like, you know, behind fisheries, like a lot of the uh, this might be something to yeah. talk to Taras about, because I think he worked in some oysters, like, you know, oyster type stuff or mussel farming. But. Yeah, like a lot yep. of the infections that affect muscles, there's a lot, like there's vaccines for, or there's viral treatments where they use bacteriophages. And yeah, I'll be, no, I'll be open. I've, I've looked into phages, but they are a pain in the ass and they only take care of one problem at a time. You know, you can only get so, you get, there's such specific, um, they're not even animals or viruses, but there's such specific entities that, you know, and, and there's a lot more problems that affect and cause illness in our corals than just Vibrio. And that's what, one of the big things is, is ah, and it is a problem. You know, vibrionic infection is big, but there's, it's just like human pathogens. There's plenty of bugs out there. So while I could probably go and take my two years of time and develop a bacteriophage that tar targets Vibrio corolliticus, it, that's one problem. And there's a lot larger ones, which is why I decided to look at the bird's eye view of what's the general pathway that causes at least all the infections that we understand and know about now. And how can we change that pathway? Question mark to have a more of a broad spectrum type of treatment, potentially. Yeah. Bacteria is a pretty good evolver as well, right? I mean, that's constantly just, just going. So you might be able to develop something to stop it, but you know, in 
a couple of years, it could just be obsolete. Right? And I mean, that's kind of so when I was doing the brown jelly, I mean, years ago before like the KFC dip and everything, I was throwing every antibiotic at it like ever, like stuff I haven't even seen people talk about. And I had success in the beginning, you know, so I was like, oh, this is the money, you know, just throw everything at it. And then I, what I believe happened is some resistance occurred. Eventually it stopped working. Same, to, I would up the dosage, you know, still double it. Like I tried to remain scientific about it back then. Um, I hadn't even taken microbiology though. So I was very ignorant about a lot of these principles, um, at least in terms of how I am now. And eventually the jelly won. So I was like, okay, this is, uh, <laughs> this is alarming. And that's kind of what's, and then like two years later, I see the, you know, the KFC dip stuff. And I'm like, well, people are going to have success with this and it's going to, people are going to, you know, think this is the solution, but I don't think it is. Yeah. I mean, it's great that people are trying to do that though. You know, the sentiment of trying to save your coral, no matter what, constructing this complex dip and using ethanol to dissolve the right, you know, like you're doing some cool chemistry and stuff. Like people are really putting an effort to save their corals, but it's just that there's a lot of misinformation or just, you know, ignorance out there about very, very complex topics. And, you know, there's not an alternative right now. That's part of the problem too. So I, I think it's great that people are trying to save their corals, but I also don't think it's the correct long-term solution for sure. Yeah. Um, you have just, as we kind of move into this next topic here, uh, and if you have any questions regarding any of the stuff that we just talked about, just leave that in the comments on the YouTube page. Salem's pretty good at answering all those questions. So if you've got anything, uh, put it down in the comments section below. Uh, you had mentioned something about LFS Saturday, and it took me a little bit to get that video out. Uh, I think it was like two weeks after Saturday that we went, but uh, nonetheless, it happened. And I feel like personally, I learned so much that day just like paying attention to the owner's stories and the owner's, you know, obstacles and tribulation, trials and tribulations at the moment. So it was, it was an eye opener, but you said it, it kind of inspired you. Yeah, no, I, so the, the Kansas city area used to be pretty active. There's like salt city. It was called, you know, local meetings, everyone hung out. And that was before like my time pretty much. I've just heard all of these stories about it. And like the local coral shows we've tried to do over the last couple of years have just kind of bombed. Like I would say, like maybe 20, 30 people turn up and there's a lot more active people in the community. So I saw that I was like, huh, you know, this really is probably the solution going forward for how to try to revitalize and keep things together is in-person events. And those have really gone away. I think COVID was a big nail in the coffin for a lot of those ending. So I started like a little uh, local saltwater society thing. And I'm going to try to get some monthly events going that are in person and maybe try to do kind of like a, what's like a round robin around the different shops, like once a month. So each shop can have like a sale of their own and people can meet the owners and get, a, you know, incorporated and talk to their LFS because online sales are great, but they're really killing the local fish store. Like a lot of how the wholesalers have a mark up some dry goods, map pricing. It's, it's good and it's bad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of the biggest concerns that local fish stores had around here was just the fact that they're not, they're not able to make any money off of yeah. dry goods anymore. Uh, there's not a whole lot of, um, of choice, I guess, when you're uh, LFS and you're looking to, you know, bring in dry goods and equipment and things like that, because there's, there's only a couple, maybe three, four handful of places that you can get you know, those things anymore. So they kind of have all of the control, which is unfortunate because then you know, for the local fish store, they're not able to mark them up that much and make money off of it. So currently it's really about fish and coral and inverts and, you know, water changes. And honestly, I think the, the backbone of most local fish stores these, these days is service. You know, you have so many service accounts and, and that's, you know, you're just constantly going back and forth to houses and that's the, that's the monthly income, right? That's the, you can count on this for the most part, you've got your, your book of clients and, and go that way. But yeah, it was, uh, how many, how many fish stores do you guys have in Kansas city? Like four or five, <laughs> I think I, I visited one this week and okay. I actually never been to, it was like maybe like an hour North and I found some cool stuff there. So I was trying to make my rounds to all of them because I know pretty much everyone else. So I had to pitch the pitch the yeah. club there. So, um, 
we uh we've got six and one of those is pretty much just fresh water i i think there might be a couple other solely fresh water um shops in the area but this one used to have salt water the art of aquary used to have salt water and you know, that that's the one i got the uh the staghorn uh, fern from because i just you know I, i'm a i'm a fan of plants every now and again but they didn't have anything that i could use uh so i just bought that but yeah, I think the uh, our local scene here in St. Louis isn't isn't bad. Um, Slash is our is our club, and that has kind of taken a little bit of a hit over the years, just because you know you get you get guys in there that really volunteer and our president and make that thing run, and it's overwhelming. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of extra work that you don't get paid to do, and so if you if you don't have the correct situation and you know family and all that kind of stuff that's all you know taking you all over the place it, it those things can suffer and i think that's probably what happens in a lot of yeah, markets no, right? for sure that's kind of what i've heard from a lot of people is no one had the time to do it like store owners certainly don't you know they've got to make ends meet in a pretty tough time right now to own a fish shop so and most hobbyists don't care enough or it's an afterthought or it's a hobby you know so there's not many people that have yeah. really stepped up to the plate or you know kind of like a local representative i don't really know what word to use there but um yeah but i think that's kind of the future of where the hobby needs to go to be sustainable is we need local heroes to go step up and make their own you know local you know clubs and stuff <laughs> and try to meet in person and talk to people yeah. that's how new people get involved so yeah yeah for sure um i think we've mentioned jeff from uh cleveland several times now uh he's like they're one of their one of their presidents or one of their uh group leads on their group and i think that's that's so cool so enthusiastic like i've said in one of the podcasts before but he brought like you know it was a very aqua shell vibe to their their local club you know um which is funny uh i'm trying to check in with raj to see what happened because is, is his screen yeah, dark for you i assumed it was like a bathroom break or like passed out from the guinness or something he texted me and says, yep, I can hear and see you guys all oh, reboot. Okay. So he's rebooting at this point. Yeah, he's been dark. I'm like, oh, I must have tapped out. Got some like food or something. Yeah. So uh, so what do you have? Uh, have you picked up anything recently as far as coral or fish go? Anything exciting you at the moment before we, before we wrap yeah, for this evening? Yeah, I got a pink bird's nest yesterday, which is like a kind of old school piece I've not seen in a long time. I was yeah. like, oh, that's cool. Which I run halides, so it looks great. Under blues, it looks like it's dead. It's like com completely white, but <laughs> uh, yeah, full spectrum yeah. looks awesome. So I was excited to get that and try to grow it out again. Yeah, I, I saw your post on that. What was the other thing you got? It was a it was a type of cingularia, or... which it's like it's typically people call it like pulsing cingularia. It's so like super low flow. It'll move oh, okay. like xenia, which is like huge finger leather. But I like leathers and softies a lot. So that was kind of like, oh, I got to buy that. I haven't seen that ever in person. Yeah. So kind of an old school piece. One of my one of my favorite online. Have you ever heard of the the vendor called marine Dude, farmers i've wanted to order i've not i don't have the cash though but i've wanted to get some stuff from him like <laughs> so much like he's got so many cool softies yeah i think his name yeah. is pablo if i'm not mistaken yeah i had i i got some uh some green capnella from him uh i still have a couple of the sarco uh he had a what he called a deep water uh green and it he's like it's the slowest <laughs> grower of all time i think he said he fragged it once in wow. eight years and even mine still i think was probably the size of a dime face and now it's only like the size of a half dollar and i've had it for three wow. or four years and you know how fast some sarcophyton species can yeah. just explode and take up your whole entire tank this thing has stayed very small for a long time so he wasn't kidding on that uh, but the whole thing is green. So like the the crown and then the base. Oh, that's hard to green, find with the so. base green too. That's cool. And when I when I first came upon his website, I was like, gosh, this guy has some of the coolest coral. You know, it's not your typical, you know, coral website with all the neons, but he's got so many different leathers and just oddball coral. Yeah, I'd like I to go it. see his stuff in person. I think he's in New York or something. So we're up that way. You're watching this, Pablo. Please invite me to your place. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do some video yeah, it'll be cool. good it'll be good for everybody <laughs> yeah i really want to get the yellow fiji leather 
I know there's some people that still have it that have aquaculture. The Tongan stuff, it's like, you know, you can get it. I've got places I can get that, but it's just not the same, at least from what I can tell. I actually um, messaged Walt Smith today, the Fiji guy, and I was doing like a little q and I want to write an article about some of like his conservation stuff, but I think he was saying, I, I say he hasn't responded about that part yet, but I think that you can actually bring in softies from Fiji still. I think it's just the stony stuff you can. So I might have to arrange, I was imagining like my pipe dream of having like a Fiji biotope, getting some of his rock and then doing like all Fiji softies. I thought that'd be kind of cool. That would be cool. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But we should take a trip. Yeah, we should just go to Fiji, Raj. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should make we can make some really good content there. We could get like ten episodes of like the YouTube series out. Probably do a podcast live with them. There's like a lot of like you know the YouTube revenue alone would probably just pay for it. Yeah, it's not even as much as Yale. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the bar now. Everything <laughs> is compared trip. to Yale. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yes, it would. Fiji trip would be yes, rad. Raj, uh, can, actually, Salem, you might take a measurements of your. Um, of your <laughs> yeah, actually, there. I should ask for a gift from everyone. You're right. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> like about at least two feet by two feet, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, at least. At least. I can't tell. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we lost Raj. Oh yeah, he's completely frozen. I thought he was yeah, just making frozen. the same expression Sorry. the whole time. I was like, that's kind of goofy. I'd be doing that. <laughs> Well, we'll have to end this without him, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, there he is. For it. Oh, he got he's resuscitated. Back. He's back. Hey, I'm I just back. love that it's not me this time. That's fantastic. <laughs> I hate that it's just. Well, me. we were just wrapping up, so. <laughs> well, that at that time I couldn't I hear or see you. Everybody Anything was else for me. So. Yeah, we were we were measuring his blinds to you know maybe. <laughs> <laughs> send them some blinds.com blinds not sponsored uh anything else you want to talk about raj before we get out of here nope i'm good i don't want to risk this connection because it's obviously <laughs> good really job. great good uh, job charter all right well i want to thank you for joining us on the reef therapy podcast if you've got any questions for salem which i'm sure you do uh raj or myself please post them in the comments section below and i think icp analysis for being an awesome sponsor more icp analysis dot com salem thank you for your time we appreciate you and uh we will see you in the next one bye see guys you. bye guys